Are you still ordering no contact delivery? Mm -hmm. Well, get ready for one more from Horror Vision 2020. But you're still going to feel the impact because the next guest is so inspirational, hardworking, and dedicated to the art, the craft, and the people around him. It is truly very beautiful. We could have listened to him all day. He was one of my favorite interviews, but we had to cut it to around an hour, okay? So we'll catch the rest on the flip side, but I can't wait for you guys to hear about his roots, starting off in Iowa as a journalist, way out in BFE, and what he did on that journey and how he did it is really, truly exceptional. He is a writer, a producer, a director, talent manager, A-listers. We know and love them all. I, I can't wait. You got to check out uh, the part where he talks about Gary Lockwood, how he got him apart on Dark Skies. It is amazing. I don't even know how he does it. That is what is so awesome about him. You got to check out one of his early uh, uh, films, a documentary about uh, the Night of the Living Dead, yes. Legacy of the Night of the Living Dead. It is pretty much uh, encompasses the uh, evolution of the film over the last 40 years. Check it out. He has a short film coming out, hopefully very soon, that is winning awards across the board, 42 so far and counting. It is a beautiful film. It's black and white, period, piece, noir project called The Tale of Two Sisters. And it is gorgeous. Can't wait for you to see it. I could keep talking about him all day, but let's listen to him instead. Tune in now for Chris Oh Yeah! Bang! What is this Spock? It's Spock, but it's a dog. It's awesome. <laughs> Man, have you been keeping yourself busy? Yeah, um, you know, just, uh, I think the first four to five weeks, it was just kind of like, what the fuck am I doing? I mean, it was like, okay, you know, something's going to change. I, I wasn't really, um, I wasn't panicked. I wasn't any of that kind of stuff. I was happy to do it. But now it's like, you know, I probably should be using this time to do something useful. Uh, so the last few weeks, I've really been kicking in and just doing like website stuff, social media stuff, cleaning out like old files and just stuff like that. So, yeah, I, I always say, oh, yeah, if I had time to do writing and do this. <laughs> I can't write right now. I've, I've laid out some some kind of outlines. Yeah. I'm not in the right frame of mind to do this. Yeah. Normally, if you were to say, look, take some time, peace, quiet, I would be like, uh, that sounds great. I'll get a lot done. Force me <laughs> to be in that situation. Forget about it. Oh. Well, Chris, this is James, Jim, whichever. I call him Jim, people call him James. How are you? <laughs> Either way, how you doing, bud? Sorry I'm late. Not at all. <laughs> oh yeah 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 so he's a a friend of mine uh actor friend from michigan and we are doing horror vision 2020 thanks for joining us today go ahead you do an intro jim you're better at that than i am but uh, intro well i do that on the green screen normally but this is chris rowe he's an <laughs> actor talent manager he's a man of many hats and that's important in this industry am i correct <laughs> You are correct. Uh, uh, you know, there was a time when uh, many years ago when you did one thing. Uh, you can't do that any longer. It's crazy. Isn't it? COVID-19 COVID has proved that. In fact, it's, yeah. probably, it's probably safe that you should probably have another career outside of the entertainment business because if it gets shut down, you're not completely shut down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You produce too, am I correct? And yeah. direct. He's a director. And direct and everything. Yeah, okay. Yeah, his, um, tell us, okay, well, let's start, and then you can tell us about your current projects. So, just want to know how you got started in, was it always just, was it horror, or you just loved the movies? Um, got started in uh, as a talent manager, or got started in as a uh, producer, director? Both. Both. Well, that's a long story. I guess we have an hour. We got um, some time. Uh, <laughs> Well, the story of myself, uh, how I started, um, 
is kind of an interesting um, story. Uh, people find it pretty fascinating. I, I started out writing journalism, uh, doing journalism when I was 15. Um, I started writing professionally uh, at the age of 15, and I, I had started a research project, and I lived in, I grew up in Iowa, and I was working on a research project on uh, one of uh, Detroit's greatest, Stevie Wonder, and, yeah. and, and living in a small town, a small farm community, really, with only about 10,000 people, uh, you go to your local library, and uh, there was really not much on Stevie Wonder in the local library in I'm Iowa, in the middle in of Iowa. the okay? Um, and what I did find was old. It was certainly was nothing current. So uh, one day I just thought, well, I'll just call Motown Records and ask them to send me something. So I, I, I called information. I got Motown Records. And um, it, this was my first experience to the, uh, and I'm going to say this sarcastically, uh, the uh, polite way of treating people on the phone in Los Angeles. And I called, <laughs> and I, I immediately you know, started, hi, I'm Chris Rowe, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm looking for information on Stevie Wonder. Please hold. And they just put me on hold. And I was like, well, I didn't finish. I didn't finish saying what I was saying. The next thing I know, this man picks up the phone with this deep voice. And um, uh, again, I kind of started saying what I was looking for. And he didn't say anything other than, what's your dress? I gave it to him. And he said, uh, thank you very much. And he hung up the phone on me. And a, a, a week later, I got this big package from Motown Records in the mail. And it had all these press photos of Stevie Wonder. It had his most recent uh, uh, CD. Um, it had all of this stuff. And I went, wow, this is pretty far out. And I think I was 14 at the time, right? So I was like, this is pretty cool. And so I got the idea. I thought, well, if it was easy to get that, then I gosh, I could start doing other things. I could get other things from record companies. And so I, uh, I went to the, to the local paper, uh, uh, school paper, and I, you know, I'm pretty blunt and to the point about things. And I said, look, I said, um, no disrespect, but this school paper is pretty boring. And I said, um, by the time it comes out, everyone knows what's happened. It's already hit the radio. It's hit the local paper. We need something to spice this up a little bit because everyone knows who won the football game because we were all there. And I said, I have this idea. I'd like to do something that's entertainment related and, and maybe you know, have a, a column in each issue. And they said, yes. And um, I'm condensing it. But what happened was I started doing that and people started reading it and a look, our local paper did a feature article on me because like weird stuff was going in there, right? Um, I, was, I was like 15 and I was like interviewing rock stars and I was, you know, going out. I was completely lying through my teeth. I, you know, I was saying to these, to these uh, record companies that I was the editor of, you know, some paper. They're like, they're like almost know. famous, like that movie. Yeah. Like yeah. famous. Because, <laughs> and because I did all the paste up myself, I would make like fake pay stops of the newspaper. So when they would say, well, send me a tear sheet of it, I'd send them a tear sheet of it, and it was not even real. Um, and so they just started sending me, like I would come home from school and there would be, my bed would be completely covered with packages from different record companies from all over the country. Oh, it's pretty cool when you're 15 years old. Got it. And, yeah. and, and so the local paper did an article on me which a neighboring paper in Ottumwa, Iowa, which was about 23, 24 miles away, saw. And they offered me a job writing as a correspondent for the county that I lived in because their circulation was very large. And I did that. Um, they hired me, I think, a, like a week or two before I turned 16. Wow. And um, I did that for uh, several years. Um, the paper uh, grew to the point that they gave me my own entertainment paper, and I was doing that. 
And then new people came in to the Atomo Courier and they knew editors and they just didn't like, they thought, well, you know, who wants to see an interview with, you know, whoever, uh, we're not a celebrity paper. This is not what we do. Um, and he just didn't get it. And all I remember his name was Cunningham and I, I gave him a different name. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I didn't last there after he took <laughs> over, but what happened was, I started writing as a freelance writer for different magazines. And because of that, it allowed me to be able to start interviewing um, bigger A-list celebrities. And I was traveling to Los Angeles and to different places. I was doing concert reviews. And uh, one day I had met an actor and I just said, I said, you know, I don't, we had become friends. Um, and I would stay with him when I would go uh, fly out to Los Angeles. Uh, I would stay with him in Malibu. And I said to him one day at dinner, I said, I completely, or breakfast, I said, I don't understand how, how it is that you're not working. I said, you've been in these iconic movies. You've worked with a couple of the biggest directors in movie history. Um, why aren't you working? And he went through all of this stuff and was you know, talking Hollywood politics that I completely didn't understand. I wasn't from the business, so I didn't know. And I just looked at him and I said, well, I don't think any of that makes any sense. I said, it's, to me, it's about talent. And if you're talented, you should work. <laughs> well, it's not that easy, let me tell you. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I was actually irritated that he had told me that I couldn't do it. I said, well, I could find you work. And he goes, ah, look, he goes, you, you can't do that. He goes, you, you live in the middle of a goddamn cornfield in Iowa, kid. <laughs> you, you need to be here in Los Angeles or New York. And I, at that point, so many people, now I'm 20, right? 21. And so many people had told me that I would never be able to do what I was doing. And yet I started it at 15 and at 16. And, uh, you know, my kids, my friends were out getting drunk and high and partying on the weekends. And was I, was going to, I was going to review like ACDC concerts and Elton John concerts. I was getting free tickets. I mean, I was getting like all this stuff. Um, and so I, I took a, a little bit of umbrage to that um, because I think growing up in a small community like I did with really not a lot of possibilities, unless you were really a go-getter, I didn't like to be told that I couldn't do something. So that afternoon, after we had breakfast, um, I had a meeting in Hollywood and I, I'll never forget, uh, it was just like it was yesterday. I came in on Coldwater Canyon I turned on to Ventura and right across the street from the Sportsman's Lodge, which is no longer there, um, was a Sprint store. And I just kind of spontaneously turned. There was a parking spot, which never happens. Um, I turned. <laughs> it was just like the movies, right? There's always a parking spot in New York City. Like, that's not, that's not, that's not real. But this was real. <laughs> I pulled in. And I, I went in and I said to, the, to this kind of California surfer kid, I said, could I get rid of my Iowa cell phone and get a California cell phone number? Because I had Sprint already and it was a Sprint store. And he was like, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so I picked out, I picked out um, uh, a Beverly Hills number. And I went into Hollywood and right before I was, looking where I needed to park, I was on Sunset and Vine, and there used to be a Borders bookstore right there. And I thought, wow, I made it early. Um, you know, I'll go into Borders bookstore. And I went in and I, I, I asked this lady who was not very nice, and she was from New York, so she was very like, just rude. And, <laughs> and I said, I'm looking for books on management. Uh, talent management and she took me to this section which was massive and I uh, <laughs> was looking and I said excuse me but I said what's good and you know she would <laughs> she would always give that sigh like I was completely wasting her time uh, <laughs> I had to remind her why she was there uh, which was <laughs> okay. and so she pointed out five books I purchased those five books I went to my meeting 
that after the meeting, I was driving back to Malibu because I was taking a red eye flight back to Iowa that night. And I saw a mailbox, et cetera. And I pulled off, I opened up a mailbox, et cetera. Uh, went back to this actor's house, didn't say a word. I already had publicity photos of him because I'd done interviews with him. And I got on a plane that night, flew back to Iowa in the middle of a blizzard, landed in Cedar Rapids. I had an hour and a half drive home, but I didn't go straight home. I went to Radio Shack and I purchased a fax machine. And I spent the next three months reading, because this was really before the internet, right? Um, reading everything that I possibly could read on talent management. And since I had done these extensive interviews with him and I had all the notes and I had his bio, I did everything. So I started looking at actors, directors, producers he had worked with, seeing who was alive, who was dead. I was doing all of those kinds of things. <laughs> many were dead, many were alive. And I just blindly started making calls. And I would pick up the phone and I would say, hi, my name's Chris Rowe with Chris Rowe Management. I represent this person, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of phone calls just never returned. And one day um, I knew that his resume had one of the greatest science fiction films of all time on it. And I picked up the phone and I, there was a, a, a show that you may remember called Dark Skies. I remember that. And it was on USA Network, and it starred J.T. Walsh, and um, it was science fiction. And I picked yep. up the phone, and I, I found the, the executive producer of the show. I found out his name. Again, this is all pre-internet, so this was not easy, okay? And no. um, I called, and I said, yeah, can I speak to Bryce Sable, please? And they said, uh, hold, please. And she was nice, not like the other rude people I've experienced. I've had experiences at times. She was from Iowa. Yeah, maybe. And, <laughs> and she, she transferred me and all of us, you know, I expected to get a secretary and I hear, Bryce Sable. And I was like, I froze. I completely froze because I was totally expecting to have to do the whole, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I actually thought about hanging up the phone. <laughs> and I thought, all that ballsy stuff <laughs> yeah, I thought it's now or never and I said Mr. Zabel how are you I'm Chris Rowe from Chris Rowe Management I said I'm wondering if you're familiar with an actor by the name of Gary Lockwood and he went Gary Lockwood from 2001 a Space Odyssey and I went yes and he said oh my god absolutely he goes that's my favorite movie of all time and I said, well, that's really good to hear because Mr. Lockwood's a big fan of your show. And I said, I'd like to get him on your show. And he paused for a second and he said, oh my God, he goes, that would be incredible. He goes, I have no clue what's coming up on the schedule, but he goes, let me take down your name and number. And he goes, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you if something comes up that, that he would be right for. And I went, okay. Hung up the phone, I thought, ha. That'll never go anywhere. One week later, the phone rings, and it is a casting office, uh, uh, April Webster Casting, which is a huge casting office here in LA. Big. Yep. And um, I went, hello. And they said, hi, this is whoever it was from April Webster's office. And they said, uh, you spoke to one of our producers last week about a client of yours, uh, Gary Lockwood. And I went, yeah. And... Uh, she didn't even say the name of the show. So I had no clue what she was talking about. I just went, yeah. And she goes, well, we really would love to have him uh, come in. We have something that we think he might be right for. And I went, great, what show is this? Because <laughs> I, again, I had no clue I had made so many calls. Um, and she told me and I went, fabulous. Uh, she goes, would you like me to send you the sides? Yeah, sure. I had no clue what sides were, right? So and she goes, what's your fax number? So I dug around. I got the fa I got the card for mailboxes, et cetera. And I gave them the fax number there. They faxed the sides to mailboxes, et cetera, mailboxes, et cetera, faxed it to me. I looked it over and I went, well, I don't know what any of this means, but it looks pretty good. And, and, and now remember, this is the first time I have ever seen anything like this. Yeah. 
So I'd never seen it. I'd read about certain things, but I'd never seen anything. And so I called Gary on the phone and I said, Gary, it's Chris, how are you? <laughs> and he was like, uh, hey kid, how you doing? I said, oh, I'm really good. I said, Gary, I said, um, I have a, a meeting set up for you for, a, for a, a, a television show. And I said, the producers want to see it. And he said, uh, well, look kid, he goes, this isn't some kind of goddamn student film, is it? And I said, no, no, this is real TV. I said, this is legitimate TV. What, you think I would set you up for a student film? Come on. And, uh, well, he kind of fought with me about it. He resisted. I said, well, look, let me fax it to you. It's no problem. Let me fax it over to you. And he goes, well, okay. He goes, well, you know, send it to uh, the mailbox, et cetera, up the street. I said, oh, that's no problem. I said, I've already faxed it over to him. He goes, well, he, goes, he said, I'll get to it. And he goes, I'll try to get there in the next few hours. And I went, okay. So um, I quickly called mailbox, et cetera. And I said, uh, that fax that came in, could you just put Gary's name on it? He's going to swing by and get it. I swear he must have jumped in his car and went warp speed up PCH to mailboxes, et cetera, because he called me within 45 minutes. And he was like, uh, well, you know, kid, this looks pretty good. He goes, uh, this is, um, oh, I mean, this is a bit before your time, but do you even know who uh, Earl Warren was? And I went, of course I know who he was. I had no clue who he was. So um, I, I, uh, so he went in a week later, met with them. He called me when he came out and he said, look, kid, he goes, I, I appreciate it. But he goes, this isn't going anywhere. He goes, they were all a bunch of kids just like you. He goes, I've been in a thousand of those meetings and that's not going to go anywhere. He goes, look, my, my career is over in this goddamn town. So just, you know, don't worry about it. I'm fine. I'm fine. And I went, well, look, you never know. He goes, look, kid, I know. I've been doing this for 40 years. I, I know, okay? It's not going anywhere. Look, I'm going to go uh, meeting my daughter at Cheesecake Factory here in Brentwood. <laughs> I'll talk to you later. And I went, okay. And he, he got off the phone, and I said a few things under my breath, and was just like, you know, whatever. What the fuck? And, <laughs> and he... he 15 minutes later, the phone rings and it's April Webster's office. And they say, hi, your client, Gary Lockwood was just in here. And I said, yeah. And they said, uh, he did a fantastic job. And they said, um, we'd like to know if he would be interested in doing this because if he's interested in doing this, we'd like to just cancel the rest of the sessions tomorrow and not even bring anybody in because we found our choice. And I went, Okay. I mean, I had no clue. Like I, I had no clue what to say. I had no clue what to do. And I said, well, what do you need from me? And they said, well, you know, we'll need his corp. Corp. It's a corp. Like I had no clue. Right. And um, so I'm writing all this stuff down and uh, I said, well, send over the offer. Go ahead and send over the offer. We'll review it. We'll get back to you. Pick up the phone. I call Gary and I'm like, Gary, Gary. Yeah, kid. I'm, uh, I'm eating uh, these avocado egg rolls here at, uh, at the Cheesecake Factory, oh, I'm like, oh, yeah. what, what's going on? I said, uh, look, Gary, I just heard from uh, the production and I said, they wanna hire you for this. And he said, quiet for a moment. And he said, uh, look, kid, he goes, uh, you don't ever fuck with an actor about work. It's just rule 101. And I said, well, I'm not kidding. I'm being dead serious with you. I said, they're offering it to you. Well, I'm not doing it for less than ten thousand dollars, blah blah blah. And I went, well, whatever. I got some questions for you. What's a corp? Oh, I got rid of my corp a long time ago. And so, so I'm, I'm like doing all this stuff. He goes in, he does it, he closes this deal, he shoots it, and a, the day after he finishes, he calls me and he says, you know what? He goes, I don't know how you did this. He goes, you live, and he loved to remind me of this, he goes, you live 2,000 miles away in a goddamn cornfield in Iowa. <laughs> and my own agent lives 20 minutes from me, and I haven't heard from that asshole in six months. <laughs> and he said, 
I can't do any worse with you. So if you want to continue doing this, he goes, uh, feel free to. Now, remember, I had no desire to do this. I was writing. That's what I was doing. I just didn't like to be told I couldn't do something. So I just wanted to, <laughs> to, to prove him wrong. And so I had to really think about that and go, is this even something I want to even think about doing? But you never forget your first. It was uh, Dark Skies. Uh, the name of the episode was The Warren Omission. And the, the role was to play Chief Justice Earl Warren of the JFK. Uh, 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 not uh, uh, inquest. And so you never forget your first. And I... I thought about it and I thought, well, this could be maybe fun. That was in 1996. And so um, I made, I think I, I started doing the research in 95 and made the call in 96 and um, booked the job for him. And so I, now 25 years almost I've been doing this and uh, I have a pretty good roster. So I know that's a long story, but there's a lot of components to it. It's a great story. And, and so, look, I never would have been able to get away with that in the, in the internet age because somebody would have caught on to me really fast. But uh, you would have done something different because that's the kind of person you are. You would have figured out a different way to approach it. I oh, never would have. I did believe that too. But it would have been harder because, you know, people would call me on the phone and they would say, hey, Chris, this is so-and-so. Hey, can we get together for a meeting? And I'd look out my window and it would be a blizzard uh, and it would be snowing. And they would say, God, you're a lucky son of a bitch. Malibu's beautiful today. He goes, I'm going to be coming out. We can get together. And I'm like, you know, that's not going to work today. Um, maybe in three days. And I would book a flight and I would fly to Los Angeles. And I flew back and forth for 10 years. Nobody knew what I was doing. Everyone thought wow. I was here. And Why 10 years? Oh, well, I had a family and, uh, okay, okay. You, know, you know, my mother got ill and, um, passed away and, you know, then other family members got ill and then my brother yep. died. One thing after another, after another. And I'm very glad that I didn't move out here because of course. What, what probably would have happened at that time because of all of the tragedy that was happening is it would have derailed me. And I would have ended up moving back to Iowa right. and, and things, never coming back. things wouldn't have happened. So I stayed there and I used it as a means of escape. And I would yeah. get on a plane and I would fly to California and I would do my stuff and I would get away from it and I'd focus on work and then I would fly back home. Um, and I did that for 10 years. And then my business had, I had basically two divisions of my business, okay? I had the theatrical management side of it. And then I had the personal appearance side of it. And um, in 2003, um, I became George Romero's manager. And um, that ended up being a, a 16 uh, year relationship uh, with, with George, um, a 15 year relationship with him until he passed. And it was one of the most beautiful uh, relationships. And the moment that happened, it became a catalyst because suddenly I had a client that was an icon. They knew him on every corner of the globe. And so if I picked up the phone, no matter what it was for, someone answered. They just did. And then from uh, George Romero, uh, ultimately uh, three, three, four years later led to Malcolm McDowell. And then everything started to shift and everything started to turn. And then it just never stopped. And I remember going, well, if there ever was a time to move out there full time, um, it's now. And so that's what I did. I moved out. And when I moved out, I was right in the middle of filming a documentary, my first film, if you will. Uh, it was a documentary film that I had done on, uh, the, the, on Night of the Living Dead. And it was for the 40th anniversary. And the Weinsteins picked it up. And I remember the money that I got from that. Um, I thought, I can move now because it was a nice <laughs> money. And so I remember moving uh, out to California and I just have never looked back since. So there you go. It's long, but it's, oh, it's all, these, it. you know, there's all these different components to it. And if, if I leave out one, it's kind of like not the complete story. 
No, but well, I that whole thing about staying there for, sorry, Tommy, about being, you know, staying there with your family, it says about, a lot about your character, yeah. your love for your family and everything else. So, yeah. heads well, off to that for you. It was very important to me. Um, I think, you know, I get asked to speak at a lot of uh, uh, lectures and I, I go in and speak to a lot of acting schools. Um, and, you know, when I tell that story, um, I always say to them, I need 20 minutes more than what you're allowing me. So if it's an hour, I always say, I need an hour and 20 minutes. Because 20 minutes is already filled with something. Yeah, but, um, it, it, you know, the, the thing that I think is the most important to understand with my story is never let somebody tell you no and never settle uh, for uh, no for the answer. And I don't do that. Um, you know, something happened a few weeks ago, five weeks ago, and I got on the phone. Uh, a family member of mine was like being kicked around by uh, their credit card company. And uh, I just happened to hear it. And I was like, what's going on? And they told me, I said, give me that phone. And I took the phone from them and I said, yeah, this is Chris Rowe. And they were like, well, we can't speak to you. You're not the person on the account. I said, yes, well, he's going to tell you that you can speak to me, right? And he's like, yes, you, you can speak to him. I said, yes, so what's the problem? No, we're not paying that. No, he can barely make his car payment. No, we're not gonna do that. No, I said, we're not gonna do that you know what, I'll pay 150 a month. That's all you're gonna get. You can take it or leave it. Oh, great, you'll take it. Okay, here you go, I'm gonna put him, I'm gonna put him back on the phone. And I handed it off and I walked out of the room and he came out later and he went, how did, how did you do that? And I've been on the phone with him for 20 minutes arguing and they just refuse, it's, it's just simple. What are they gonna do? What you call it alpha do? male, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, no money. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> or they're going to take something. Of course they're going to take something. Take something right. They don't care that you're suffering right now. They only care about themselves. Right. So you really just can't take no. And I, you know, I found that to be very effective um, when, when negotiating, because obviously I've been, I'm very blessed to have um, a, a stable of really iconic actors and, yeah. and, and industry. And directors, Clive Barker was at the show last year. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. So it's like, you know, that alone gives you a little ammunition when you walk into a room because you're in that room because they want to talk to you anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the first rule of thumb always is even if you're desperate, you never let those uh, folks know that you're desperate because they'll completely take advantage of you. Right. And they'll throw you scraps, and if they smell that you're desperate, they, they just go, well, he'll take it or she'll take I know it. That. And, you know, so when I'm talking on the phone about one of my clients, um, they think every single client of mine lives in Beverly Hills, drives a Mercedes, and has caviar at night uh, with, with little crackers and cream cheese. And, 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 and I want them to think that because the networks will take absolute full advantage of you. I'm talking about, you know, the, the, stu the big studios and the networks. They will take advantage of you. Um, and they don't care. And uh, so it's important that they always know that, you know, we, uh, they need us far more than we need them. Right. And you know what? Sometimes we need them a lot, but yeah. I never, let, I never let leave them, them know. because you don't want to do let that. let them see you sweat. <laughs> so it, is, it really is um, important that you don't take no for an answer and you don't let someone hold you back. Um, I have used that my entire life with everything that I've done. The movie I did, um, every project I do, the movie I did a year and a half ago, um, originally set out to be a very small, little, tiny project. And more and more people kept coming to me going, well, this, this is gonna cost this. And I would be, okay, and this is gonna cost this. And I'd be, okay, and this is gonna cost this. And I'd be, okay but I understood it and I knew it. And it was a complicated piece to shoot anyways, cause it was period piece and it was 1949, it was black and white. And so I thought, you know, the biggest problem that I see people make, at least on the filmmaker side, is they're so anxious to film that they will go, oh, I can make that work. Well, you can't. Uh, you know, sometimes that extra $3,000 that you needed was, 
worth waiting a little bit longer to get because now you could afford proper sound or proper lighting. It does absolutely no good to have a really nice project, maybe really well acted, but your sound's bad. Or oh, yeah. your lighting, or lighting's great, sound's great, directing's great, but you stuck your friends in it, which you probably shouldn't do because usually friends aren't that great. And you do it to save money. You, 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 you spent money in all the right places, but you left out acting. Yeah. And that's yeah. important too. I don't care if they're a friend. I have lots of friends and they all wanted to work on it. And I said, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> and it pissed a few of them off. Um, and I was totally okay with that because um, I knew what I wanted. I knew that they were not right for it in the first place. If they were right for it, I would have, I would have asked them. Um, uh, but I'm blessed because I also have a talent roster. So I've got yeah. Emmy, <laughs> Emmy Globe winning actors. I've got Grammy winners, I've got Oscar nominated people. So I had a nice pool of people to choose from, but even then I picked and choose who was the right person, not, oh, well, because I'm closer with this one than that one. Yeah. And I think that's a mistake that people make. Um, and you, you know, you have to sometimes know when to accept no. Um, and, but you need to learn to uh, not accept it uh, at other times. And that's a really important thing that I think people fail to understand. And if you haven't been in the business for a while, um, it's easy to just say, okay, and turn and walk away. And um, I have a lot of stories where I started to turn and walk away and then something said, you've never let anyone do this to you ever. <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? And I mean, I went from feeling kind of sorry for myself to, what did you say? And then I was like, I'm not going to allow that to happen. And I didn't. And like, these things happened. And, and so I think it's important to always remember that. So I do talk about that with colleges a lot. And, and, and uh, well, I know thousands of people that know you from all of the conventions and things like that but they don't know anything about you. So I'm so excited to be able to share this with them. Because well, I, well, I love the fact that they don't know anything about me. Um, <laughs> They're gonna uh, know now! <laughs> because because um, for the longest time, I didn't let people know that I was a theatrical manager who did the convention stuff. Kept it because separate. I really wanted to keep them separate because um, people treat you differently um, and Hollywood agents and managers are known for being assholes and, um, uh, and really complicated, and hard to, you know, they ask for ridiculous things that their clients don't even get for films. Right. Um, you know, five first class tickets and $200 a day per diems. I know! <laughs> and, you know, car service around the clock. I mean, and, and so I always felt that if they knew that I did both, that they would be very hesitant to talk to me or they would be um, maybe a little bit more evasive and I didn't want that. So I kept the two very separate and I did that intentionally. And one day I was at a film festival uh, or a premiere and of a movie and I was with a client and I was walking up the red carpet and there were photos all over the place. And someone called me and they said, what are you doing on this carpet? What, what, what are you doing? And I didn't know what they were talking about because I'm thinking, well, how did you know? Well, duh, there's 75 cameras out there. Not thinking that this would end up on the news or in magazines or any of that stuff. And that's when it broke. That's when people started to find out that I didn't do just this or I didn't do just that. And so then I had to give in and kind of my secret was out as far as that went. Um, but I'm a man of many secrets. And I <laughs> always like to keep it that way. It's better, it's better to be a mystery to people than for people to think that they know you too well. So I, I don't have to then cut this down to five minutes. So I can keep it full length. <laughs> it's just gonna be okay. Just let it flow. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe Tommy didn't get the memo. I think I told her we needed an hour and a half. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't get that. 
<laughs> to be honest, I could listen to it all day. Oh, man. We'll make our own little docu-series. So the, mo the movie uh, is a tale of two sisters that you recently have done. Fabulous movie. Is there somewhere people can watch it? Not yet. Um, it's actually still out on the festival circuit. I'm really right. proud of it. Um, we've won uh, uh, 42 awards from around the world for it. Um, with everything from best actress, best director, best thriller, horror, uh, mystery, um, uh, our costume, uh, production design, music, uh, editing, design all, is great. Yeah, which, really which great. is wonderful. Um, so I'm really proud of it. And so it's out on the festival circuit. I'm, I'm very blessed because it's gotten a lot of press and a lot of short films never get press. Right. Um, but mine, mine has, uh, it has a great cast, stars um, Tracy Lords, uh, Bruce Davison, Michael Broderick, Raj Gentle, and um, Monty Markham. Uh, all wonderful actors with really great resumes. And, uh, you know, it's a 1949, black and white, uh, noir style piece. It's kind of my homage to cinema of that time period. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm really proud of it. it. It was, it was again, you know, when they would come to me and they would say, well, uh, we're gonna need an extra 5,000 to do this. I, it didn't take long for me to go, you know, I understand. George Romero taught me, know every department of your crew so when they come to you and they ask you for more money or they ask you for more time to do something you know whether that's real or if they just don't know what they're doing with their jobs and so you know um, most departments are used to working with a strict budget and you know my wardrobe gal would come to me and she would say chris you know, i'm not finding what you're looking for i think we can get by with these costumes and i'm like nope that will not do uh, and she goes well i'm gonna have to go to universal and rent 1940s costumes and i went oh well go do that and she was like it's gonna cost and i went okay so uh, she was like i i didn't know i had the ability to do that she was i'm used to producers saying no and so um not that I advise every single person to put themselves in debt, but, um, <laughs> but to me, if you're doing something, especially on film, it has to be perfect. It has to be right because the whole world's going to see it. And I'm going to be really frank here. People release a lot of shit and it's garbage. And because of all the shit that people make and the garbage that people make, AFM and all these places are filled full of garbage and it lowers everything. It lowers the market because they go, oh, well, we've got 30 of those sitting around here. That we, and it really hurts everything. Um, and so my little project that was meant to be 20,000 went to like 85. Um, but you know what? I'm completely proud of it. Um, I, I feel, and it's not just my opinion, it's the opinion of a, of a lot of really great industry professionals, um, I feel like uh, it's, it's perfect in every department. I gave every department the money that they really needed to make it work. Well, it um, looks like it costs even more than that. It doesn't look like it just... Well, but, you know, well, but that also goes with, you know, another 30,000 in favors because I knew, right, that's you know, I knew so many of the, 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 I mean, the actors and the crew, had I paid their normal rates, that would have been... Yeah. you know 150,000 so but uh, don't settle for um don't do it just to do it your name is on it if you're out promoting it you don't want it to look like shit and people go what was that you want people to walk away if nothing ever happens nothing else happens with my film i know i made something that was really good i know that i'm i'm not embarrassed of it in any way shape or form and I'm, I've, I'm very proud of the work that every one of my crew and cast uh, uh, performed on that. Um, they were wonderful. And um, so if it goes nowhere, I'm still proud. Yeah. But it has. It's won all these awards. It's done all these great things. And we're working uh, on uh, uh, doing an anthology series uh, called Cemetery Tales. Um, and this right now is kind of being used as, as pilot, so to speak. Um, the great thing about it is 
I can do black and white, I can do anything because it can be at any period of time. And um, if for some reason the anthology series doesn't work, then I can make it an anthology movie. Yeah. And um, which is, again, it's kind of unique because I have kind of a multi multi-platform that I can do with it. Uh, so we'll see. I have uh, producers and some people and, and investors looking at it now. And that's one of about seven, eight projects and properties that I own um, uh, or am developing now. Uh, I have a few projects that are optioned over at Warner Brothers. Uh, a production company at Warner Brothers has optioned one. Um, so, you know, we're just kind of waiting to see. But I had to impress. And because of the work that I did with Tale of Two Sisters, it opened up doors for people to see. There's nothing worse than having someone come to you and go, oh, I'm a writer, I'm a director, I'm an actor, I'm whatever. And you see their footage and it's horrible. <laughs> it doesn't make you look very good. And it makes, uh, and you know what the problem is, is if you get better in time, they will never forget the crap that you brought them in the very beginning. So I know. You know <laughs> you have the opportunity to get back through the door again. Like in Hollywood, it is true. Sometimes you have one opportunity and that's it. And so um, with the Tale of Two Sisters, I am not embarrassed in any way to show that to anyone. Um, and again, you know, everyone from Clive Barker, Mary Lambert, Darren Bowsman, and John Harrison have had really beautiful things to say about it. And so, you know, we put together a really nice uh, press kit uh, that really kind of says everything that we needed to say. It has the press, it has like quotes, it has the festivals we've won. And that's made it really um, easier. Not easy, but easier to get through doors. Um, and so you're, you're used to not being, it not being easy. You'll take it on, I know it. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I, I like, you know, sounding old fashioned, but there's more than one way to skin a cat. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You just have to find, you know, different ways of doing it. Even now, sometimes I'll have an idea of casting and I'll take it to a casting director and the casting director's like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't think he's right for that. And um, so I find a way to get to the producer. The producer goes, Oh, that's an incredible idea. <laughs> so you piss a lot of people off, do you? <laughs> but what you also have to do is you have to learn who you can piss off and the people you can. Exactly. exactly. It's this teeter-totter all the time, this balancing act trying to figure out, okay, yep. am I going to fuck up my relationship with this person? Uh, wait a minute. This is a $300,000 job. Yeah, I'll yep. fuck up my relationship with that person. <laughs> They don't bring in enough clients of mine for it to matter. Oh, no, I don't want to screw up that relationship. Yeah. They bring in too many clients. So, again, it's this balancing act. But, you know, sometimes casting directors, I have great respect for them, and I do have wonderful respect for them. Um, but they're not God. They don't always know. And sometimes I think because they're so inundated with so much, they're doing multiple shows at the same time and movies, it's easy to just be comfortable going to your little file cabinet of names that you know and trust. Right. And it makes the process go along quicker. Right. Most casting directors know I'll never waste their time. That's just not what I do. So if I do come to them with a suggestion or idea, it's because I've really thought it out and they know I don't like to waste their time. And that most of them that I know well are, are really good about listening, but every once in a while I have to. <laughs> I have to be like an illegal alien and drill a tunnel the bar, come up into the producer's office and go, hey, hey. Don't, tell, don't tell the casting director that I did this, okay? <laughs> She'll call Trump on me. She's a Trump. <laughs> oh. <laughs> funny. oh man. No, um, is there like a website or something someone can come and just follow you on? Like Chris oh, well, God, we have so many of them. Okay. Um, Give us a few so people can click the, it. The, the uh, talent management website is chrisromanagement.com. The 
um, my production company website is <clears throat> teatimeproductions.net. T. Uh, that's T. And um, then, you know, you can follow us on Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff. It's under Chris Rowe Management. Yeah, all of yeah, the exactly. productions and all that stuff. There's so much. Okay. I hate social media. <laughs> well, it's, we'll put some stuff out there for you. So so you it's taken me weeks just to do Zoom. <laughs> I, yeah, I kept saying, well, can we Skype? And they're like, ooh, who does Skype anymore? It's Skype I'm now. Like, it's like MySpace. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I know. I only know Skype. What are you talking about? So I did a lesson. <laughs> I, I I I had my best friend come help me, and I was like, "Look, you gotta come over and help me." I don't know how to fuck to do this. Well, I do Zoom. I said the only time I've ever used Zoom was Aretha Franklin's "Who's Zooming Who." That's the only thing <laughs> the only time I've ever even like heard the word Zoom, right? And so, uh, like, I got it all figured out, and, and uh, uh, so you're like my third Zoom. Awesome. <laughs> well, well, now there's Google Meet, so Google's oh, gonna yeah, be the competitor. It's going to be like, ah, let's use Google. And you're going to be like, what the fuck, really? Exactly. Yeah, I use Zoom, it. only Zoom. I'm Zoom. I paid for the subscription. Yeah. <laughs> I've already rooted down. I paid for the subscription. I have this monthly breakfast where all the clients get together every month. And I've done it for years. And everyone loves it. And, of course, we haven't done it the last few months. And I said to my assistant a couple days ago, I said, why don't we do one of these virtual breakfasts and have everybody come on? I said, we could do like Zoom. And she was like, oh, that's really cool. That's a good idea. And I said, well, she said, do we do it the first Wednesday of every month? And I said, for God's sakes, are you fucking kidding? I said, I'm so fat right now. I said, I need at least another 15 days to detox. So we've made our monthly breakfast at least as of now, June 15th. Okay. <laughs> It'll give me, a, give me a chance to slim up a little bit. I've almost been glad no one's been able to see me. <laughs> I mean, a, a couple days ago, it got to the point where I said, I have to stop eating. I am turning into Orson Welles. That's you look great, but I'm like, yeah, I'm man. So, just like crazy. <laughs> dapper. Looking dapper to me. Uh, I'm wearing black. It helps. <laughs> <laughs> so... Cool. Thank you so much for your time. This is awesome. If you ever have anything you want to like promote or, or get out there, let us know. We'll do other interviews. Well, look, I love that. And I'll, 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 uh, I'll help you in any way that I can. I think you mentioned you were doing something like this a while ago. Um, well, actually, we planned this before COVID. We mm -hmm. were going to do this anyway. We were going to like do it so people all around the world could enjoy mm -hmm. like conventions. So when this happened, we just decided we're just going to give it away for free. We're just going to start doing it while we're here and let everyone just share in it. So, and it's, it's great. We have such a great response. Oh, good. And is this, is, so yeah. is this, uh, does this turn into a podcast that you then send out? Is no, that we just put it's, it on Facebook and Instagram. So oh, we have yeah. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, right now we're trying to direct traffic to obviously like Motor City Nightmares gets a big draw and then we're, Obviously, over time, we want Horror Vision Horror to be Vision. an Instagram, YouTube thing. Um, I keep posting on on social media as much as we all love it. Stuff um, we and do. We I do a green green screen intro. Like I do a quick, exciting intro. Like exciting. I'll I'll tag you in it. I'll tag you in it when so you can check it or go check out the other ones. I don't know, but when I get this edited, I'll tag you. This is great. So the people who hate me will continue to hate me. And the people who like me will continue to like me. And those, you don't have any haters. You're doing something wrong. And those, and, those, and those who haven't made up their minds, I have a 50-50 chance. That's right. Yep. Hey, you got you, you won, you won per, one right here. I met you. And, and I'll tell you what, man, I could listen to your stories all day. You have a great personality, great character, and I love it. We both come from small towns, though. I come from a small town at 10,000 in Michigan. You understand. <laughs> middle of corn, and I lived in the middle of cornfields, baby. <laughs> For real, he did. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I understand it. Well, look, stay safe. Thank you so much. If you need anything else, let me know. Awesome. Space time filler, just call me. Okay. All right. Thanks, Chris. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Good meeting you, man. Bye.